Hey. Well, good morning, all. Good morning. Uh, I just can't believe my luck. Uh, I get to preach again on the subject that is my long suit, right in my wheelhouse. Today we're going to be talking about the, the reading that we have from the book of Genesis, Jacob wrestling with God, wrestling, that's my long suit. Not many of you know this, but I used to do the ring announcing at the Brown County Arena for All Star Wrestling. <laughs> I did. I'm not making that up, okay? I was, uh, you know, it was before WrestleMania hit and before the let's get ready to rumble thing. And, and I was in the ring with guys like Bobby the Brain Heenan, Wicked Nick Bockwinkle, The Crusher, the wrestler who made Milwaukee famous, Baron Von Rusky. And yes, Ivan Putsky. You bet. You didn't want him sitting on you. Andre the Giant. And uh, many, many more. And in fact, I was even uh, hit over the head once with a chair by Mad Dog Bashan. That explains a lot. <laughs> but yeah. It, anyway, that, that kind of wrestling was for entertainment. And the wrestling we're going to talk about today is much more serious and it has eternal significance for you and for I. So before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thy word is truth, and may that truth be humbly spoken in this message here today, that your word might go forth and accomplish your purposes, all for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to start out with a little backdrop uh, of our text, what was going on before this all happened. Jacob was about to meet up with his big hairy brother Esau, who we haven't seen in 20 years, by the way. And if you recall, Jacob had to flee the ranch because he had deceived his father into giving him the blessing that belonged to Esau. Esau was really ticked about this and said, you wait till dad dies, I'm going to kill you. Love you too, brother. Rebecca, mom, gets word of this and says, you better get off to Uncle Laban. So she sends Jacob off to Uncle Laban. He's there for 20 years. Now he's coming home, and the next day he's going to be running into Esau, and he's been told that Esau has got 400 men with him. So this was not looking real good here for Jacob. Not good at all. So he kind of has a plan, comes up with an idea. Before he, he meets up with Esau, he decides to send off his goods in wave after wave, kind of like a peace offering. And then he separates his wives and his children from the group for their protection. And the Bible tells us he is then left all alone. And that whole scenario reminds me of that Martin Luther hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. You know that part that says, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth prevails. His kingdom is forever. So let that be our first lesson today. Goods and family are temporary blessings from God. They are to be valued and treated as such but God must be number one. It's a matter of priorities. God, family, and goods way down the line somewhere. Remember, your kingdom is temporary. God's kingdom is forever. So we pick up the story with Jacob being left all alone, and we have a quick second lesson for us here. Matters of faith are worked out between you and God alone. There comes a time when your children, just like you, will have to own their own faith. You don't get to heaven on someone else's coattails. You get to heaven on the coattails of Jesus alone. It's the ultimate wrestling match for each one of us. To be sure, we as parents train up our children in the way that they should go, getting them ready for this big match. But we trust God for the results. 
because it's God who grants repentance and faith. We do our part by sharing his word and living that word out in front of our children, but ultimately repentance and faith comes from God. It's a gift, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Some of you today here maybe haven't had that wrestling match with God. For you younger people that are here today, that match usually takes place in your high school years or maybe when you go off to college, when you're going to hear a lot of people coming at you saying, did God really say? And doubt is cast into your faith. Know this when you, before you go, that there will be tremendous pressure from the devil, the world, even your flesh, you, trying to pull you away from that, from, from that saving faith in Jesus. The devil's very name is Diabolos, and that means to cast asunder, to separate. The devil is his name, separation from Jesus Christ, separation from saving faith is his game. So know that, young people, going in and hang on to Sunday school answer, Jesus. Take it from someone who has wrestled. Jesus is all that matters. Now let's get back to the story. Kind of weird the way Jacob's wrestling opponent is introduced in the story. One moment Jacob is alone, and the next moment the Mr. X, the masked marauder, is in the ring with him. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? Why did he have to physically wrestle with Jacob, I mean, couldn't they just sat down and talk this over a little bit? Why the wrestling match? Well, time prohibits me from talking about things like theophanies and uh, it's, I don't know. Uh, but take it from me, the angel of the Lord here is none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So Jacob is wrestling with God. That's who he's wrestling with. So we know who's a, who the opponent is here, but why a wrestling match? Good question. Well, often in the Old Testament, we're presented with physical activities or events that portray spiritual realities. And this event is a great picture of the spiritual wrestlings that take place in our own lives. When repentance comes your way, when you begin to think differently about your life and you desire to turn away from your way of living and trying to follow God's way of living, guess what? you will have grapplings with God, no escaping it. Galatians 5.17 reminds us of that truth. For the flesh, you, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Anyone identify with that? I know I do. These wrestling matches aren't easy. The devil, the world, and our flesh will struggle with us in our most vulnerable areas. But you know what? Learn to praise God for these struggles. Though they may be tumultuous, they are proof positive that the Spirit of God is working in your heart and in your life. When these struggles come, always be ready to be corrected by God through his word. Be ready to say, uncle, to Jesus, surrender, because when you do, another part of the kingdom grasps or seizes you. God is very patient with us. He's persistent. He's relentless. He doesn't weary. And his desire is to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So persevere in the struggle. Stay in the ring. Don't give in to your flesh. One commentator writing on this passage had this to say. He said, it is God's good pleasure to be vanquished by the stranglehold of faith. It is God's good pleasure to be vanquished by the stranglehold of faith. We read about that in Hebrews 11. Uh, before we started the message here. So in your darkest hours, when you're ready to throw in the towel of faith in God, or when you're battling temptation, ready to give in, 
Remember those words and hang on. Luke 12, 32 says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants you to win this match. And you win by persevering and submitting to him. You know, when I was doing all-star wrestling, I never saw one wrestler win a match by walking back to the dressing room. You got to stay in the ring. In Jacob's case, I really like the term until the breaking of day because it speaks of light eventually breaking through in your struggle with faith and sin. It seems like an eternity sometimes, but hang in there. I speak from personal experience in this matter too. There were many times, especially as a new Christian, that I wrestled with the Holy Spirit and all I was able to do, like Jacob, was to hang on. These spiritual battles were intense, many times triggered by the silliest things and mostly at the points where things weren't going the way Dwayne wanted them to go. And so the devil would come along and say things like, what's the use? This faith life, it's stupid. It's too hard. Go back to your old ways. <laughs> but my mantra was, I ain't going back, Jack. I've been there, done that, and I ain't going back there again. And even if it was just a spider's web width of hope, I would cling to that. And the funny thing is, looking back, I could see that it wasn't me clinging to God. It was God clinging to me and pulling me through. So let him cling. Stop looking to score points by escapes and reversals. Stay in the ring. He'll pull you through. And I've also learned, though, in these struggles that you may, you know, you may hang on and pull through, but he'll be back. He'll have a rematch. Always be prepared to struggle never goes away. Ever be ready. And often during these struggles, we are forced to confront our own specific sins. And we see the same thing here with Jacob as the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, what's your name? Come on, we know that the angel of the Lord knew Jacob's name. He just wanted Jacob to say it, to speak it, to confess it. And so he says, my name is Jacob. That means, his name Jacob means deceiver. My name is deceiver. I'm a deceiver. I'm a liar. A confessed sin. Finally, a lifestyle of lying and cheating. And it's laid bare before God, for God could deal with it in his life. In our wrestlings with God, we too are often challenged with the same question. Who am I? And the generic answer, and it's a good one, I'm a sinner. Yeah, we're all sinners. Don't ever forget that. But this wrestling match with Jacob is a reminder that God wants us to be a little more specific. What are the areas of sin in your life that are holding you back from being all God wants you to be? What are they? For Jacob, it was deceitfulness. For David, it was murder and adultery. These men needed to be confronted with their specific sins so they could confess them, admit to them, receive God's forgiveness, and be set free. Jacob wrestled one night. David wrestled for years. Listen to David's struggle and his release from it as recorded in the 32nd Psalm. He said, blessed, oh, how very happy is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit, no attempt to cover it up. When I kept silent, when I covered it up, and when I denied it, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. But then the next verse, we get the cure. Listen to what David says. I acknowledge my sin to you. <laughs> my name is Jacob. And my iniquity I have not hidden. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. These men needed to be set free from their burden of sin, and they were set free the moment they confessed. Where is that unnecessary burden of guilt pressing in on your life? Let the Holy Spirit nail it down for you, and then confess it and receive God's forgiveness and be set free. You know, there are many lists of specific sins in the Bible, but there was no single list of all sins, except maybe the Ten Commandments, okay? And these specific sins that are listed in the Bible, they all fit under one commandment or another. I saw a post on the internet this morning where someone took the time to list all these sins found in the New Testament, and he came up with 124. I'll name them for you. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> 124 separate sins. I do want to talk about one such list, though, a list of 10 that were found in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, 9, and 10. It reads as follows, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, sex outside the bounds of marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Specific list. The Holy Spirit, using the word of God, is naming our sins. He's naming the sins of the Corinthians. Yes, you and I are sinners, but how do we know that? What constitutes sin? Where are you and I goofing up? What does the Bible call sin? That's what matters. Are you guilty of it? Well, then confess it and receive God's promised forgiveness. We have this sure promise if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then don't forget the rest of the story. It's why I chose this passage in Corinthians. Because after providing this list of ten, this partial list of damning sins, the very next verse holds out this holy hope for you and I. It says in verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Were some of you. In this list, of course, Paul was speaking specifically to these Corinthians and their former lifestyles of sin. Fact, this is the stuff that they were doing. This is how they were goofing up. But something happened. Something happened to change all this. The Apostle Paul came into town preaching the gospel. They heard the gospel. They came to faith in Jesus Christ, and they got baptized. And their sins were washed away. And they were sanctified. They were set apart from that old crummy way of living and set on the path of following Jesus. And they were justified. God now looked at them just as if they had never sinned. They were no longer identified by their sin. And you don't have to be identified by them either. They had a new name, and that name was Christian, follower of Jesus Christ. Now, what do you think? Were these sins that the Corinthians had been participating in, were they good or bad things? They are bad things. Were they God-pleasing or not? No, they were not God-pleasing. Do you think the Corinthians then were walking around and thinking, well, I've been washed, sanctified, and justified. I might as well go back living the way I was. I know that seems like a stupid question. But honestly, as I look around the church, capital C, today, I wonder sometimes if that isn't what people are thinking. And Paul, uh, you know, this is nothing new. Paul addressed this in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, he says. 
How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And therein lies the struggle, doesn't it? That's the wrestling match that you and I and every Christian must deal with on a daily basis. It's a struggle. It's a very intense spiritual battle. Our flesh says, yes, 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 to sinful pleasures. Our whole, the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 don't go there. We're all in the same ring with the Apostle Paul, this great man of God, who said in Romans 7, 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Then in verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Sunday school answer. Jesus. Who? Jesus. Yes, through Jesus. It is Jesus Christ who gives us that enduring faith and helps us through. Are you struggling with any of those 10 sins of the Corinthians or any of the other 114 spelled out in Scripture? Listen, endure in the struggle. Stay in the ring, trusting Jesus to get you through. And you know what? There's going to be times that you fail. And when you fail again, keep trusting to Jesus. Bring it to the cross. Confess it as sin and trust his promised forgiveness. And try again. Get up off of the mat. Well, how many times should I keep trying? How about 490? Matthew 18, 21 reminds us, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? That's pretty generous. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven, 490. Now, Jesus wasn't speaking literally. We don't keep a tally board on this. He was just saying as often as necessary. Get up off of that mat as often as necessary. Keep seeking forgiveness. And we, the church, we are to keep offering it to you through the faithful preaching of the gospel of Christ and the administering of the sacraments. Struggle. Don't be afraid of the struggle. Struggle with your sinfulness. Don't give up. As Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, he said, I will not let go. I will not give up unless you bless me. And the blessing came in the form of a new name for Jacob, Israel. And honestly, there is no higher goal in your spiritual life than this, to receive a new name from God, because that's the end game. Revelation 3.12 says this, he who overcomes, he who stays in the ring and wrestles to the end. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. This is what awaits those who endure to the end those who overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, a new name given to them by God. Therefore, my fellow travelers, my fellow sinners, let's hang in there. Keep confessing. Keep repenting. Keep getting up off of that mat. Keep coming to the Lord's table to receive, A, the strength for the battle, and B, the forgiveness for the times you fail. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. It's Jesus Christ coming to take his overcomers to glory. Be the way. Be there. Stay in the ring. Amen.